Less than 30 minutes, so we'll, we'll get a move on and then we'll go to the pub afterwards. All right. So, um, as you've seen, uh, I've done a, a lot of uh, work on 3D printers and um, that bloody photograph is following me around everywhere, but at least everything is proceeding as we have foreseen. <laughs> so, why did we actually go and invent this wonderful 3D printer? Well, in short, uh, because that never happens. Um, <laughs> hardware doesn't generally tend to reproduce itself. Uh, manufacturers have absolutely um, no intention of selling you machines that will reproduce yourself, uh, themselves and you can give to your friends. Uh, but we had the technology um, and we had some ideas about how to apply it. So we, we went ahead and did it for the benefit of all society and everything like that. Um, and um, no, we still haven't managed to print mice that actually do that. So uh, how does our wondrous 3D printing stuff work? Because I never got to do that yesterday. So I can tell you. Well. Our little, uh, our little machine like an electro, uh, like, is like a, basically a glorified computerized glue gun. Plastic is uh, pushed through a heated barrel, which warms up plastic, pushes it out. The residual heat in the plastic and the heat conducted through by the nozzle uh, fuses the layer above to the layer below, which is why it's called fused deposition modeling, which is uh, a trademark of Stratasys. Uh, so we call it freeform uh, fabrication instead. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether you're using plastic squirted out of a, a hot nozzle or, or um, cutting up layers of paper and sticking them on top of another, one another. Yes, there is a machine that does that. Or you're, you're um, using inkjet nozzles to harden layers of plaster or you're using photopolymers, sintered layers of metal, all that stuff. Uh, but 3D printers all work nearly on layers, like an onion, or uh, maybe, maybe a cake, yeah, or parfait. Yeah, everybody likes parfait, um, but you might not like um, uh, Chloe, uh, uh, Chloe Rutzenfeld. Um, she's a student at Eindhoven, and uh, she uh, has printed a, a parfait, which was made from tissue cultured mouse liver. So uh, yes, she, she does a lot of 3D printed uh, food and uh, if you can call printed mouse liver food. <laughs> um, the, the cake uh, is by a chef called Von Hasseln um, who has created something called a chef get <coughs> printer and he prints his layer cake out of layers of sugar. As you can see, it does multicolour as well. Very nice. And uh, the onion, uh, that was sort of a uh, conceptual art thing by a chap called David Bow uh, Bowen. And um, he has a scanner which scans the growing onion shoots and then prints a 3D replica of it every few hours. So you've got a sort of 3D record of how this plant is, is growing. Very nice. Um, the, the, the kit he's using there over on the right of the display um, is actually very, very similar to the original uh, 3D uh, printer child that I showed you in the first slide. Um, it's extremely simple and uh, like most 3D printers, it's, it's not rocket science. Well, it's not rocket science until NASA get hold of it. Uh, this is their compact version. Um, you have to be careful when you start putting 3D printers in space. Um, if you've seen the one operating, you, you will notice that as people build things, lots of crap accumulates in the bottom of the printer that people have shaved off the bed and snapped off the plastic filament and everything. Okay, that, that's not much of a problem when it's sitting on your desk. However, when that's all floating around in zero gravity in front of your face and up your nostril, um, it's, it's not so nice. And when it's still uh, in the molten blob of plastic form floating around the capsule, uh, it is definitely not your friend. So, um, that's in the Vomit Comet. You know the Vomit Comet? Big zero gravity aircraft, uh, uh, simulator in an aircraft goes up and down in free fall. Makes everybody go, hmm. Um, anyway, so like I say, it's not rocket science, uh, which, which I think is probably just as well, uh, given 
what some rockets tend to do these days. Yeah, ouch. And I got a feeling this is not going to end very well either. No. Okay, enough rocket science. Uh, but, <laughs> so having said that, of course, you then find the bugger who has turned it into rocket science. This is um, the Dragon V2 engine by SpaceX. It is made from 3D printed, laser centered titanium. And there's not one there, there's two of them. And they've got failover systems between the two of them. Nice thing about building rocket engines with 3D printers, no seals, no nuts and bolts to come undone. All right. They have four of these puppies around their, uh, around their Dragon capsule. Um, and these uh, provide, first off, a quick getaway from the main rocket if things go horribly wrong on liftoff. Um, and also a nice comfy way of, of stopping it splatting into the ground when it comes back down again. Uh, these, uh, the four packs of those together put out 120,000 pounds of axial thrust. That's not bad for something that's 3D printed. Um, I can show you what one of them looks like. That's half of, a, uh, of the, the motor being test fired. These things get really hot. Lots of uh, high pressure stuff involved. And bear in mind that's only one half of a thing which there are four of clustered around the capsule. It's uh, quite an impressive sight when it goes, when it goes up. Um, but for me, this concept of, uh, of 3D printing spacecraft and things is uh, going full circle for me because I actually started uh, working on 3D printing because of life support systems in space that needed repairing. Um, and uh, what, what I find particularly cool about 3D printers in space is that they have now developed a uh, 3D printer which has uh, recently been taken up to the space station. Um, and there it is, you can see it's in a nice little box to, to stop the hot bits leaking out into the, in, into the cabin. Um, and uh, <laughs> irony of all ironies is that was actually lofted up using one of those capsules that had 3D printed engines in it, which is kind of neat. Um, as you can see, it's all enclosed and fireproof and everything, and um, it's had to be designed specifically for that environment. It's not unusual. All 3D printers are designed for their environment. And that design can also take, uh, also, um, sorry, that environment also means the environment in which they're manufactured. All right? So if you're making a 3D printer for yourself as a hobbyist in a fab lab or a, a makerspace or something, you've got a completely different set of rules that you're going to go by if you're trying to, uh, than if you're trying to make uh, 3D printers for the local market like I do. So for example, a 3D printer like that has 220 nuts in it. They all need lining up and tightening up and being kept tightening, uh, tightened up. Um, and that is not really sane for something that you want to try selling to people. Right. It's too hard to put together and you're not going to put it together for them. Um, and you can go to the other extreme. Uh, you can have things with really nice, flash, shiny boxes that cost an absolute fortune to design and make. Um, and what's more, uh, they're going to be about obsolete in about six months. So that's not sane for doing uh, a local build. Also, these things tend not to be open source because people want to recover their investment and all that crap. Um, so, uh, lo so for uh, local manufacture, I came up with that sort of thing. You can click on the buy now button anytime. Um, it, it's made from local materials. If I was designing that machine to be made in China, I'd probably make a pressed steel body. I'm not. I'm doing it in New Zealand. We got lots of wood, um, and the rails are made of aluminium because we've got lots of aluminium as well. I've just got aluminium plant down the road. I can order it up. Um, it's open all the way. That, that's that's really helpful for the local market uh, because what I sell a, a lot to are uh, engineering firms, small engineering firms, and they are really happy that that machine does not have a new user serviceable parts inside sticker stuck on the side of it because they really want to play around with it. Um, they want to know that if I vanish in a puff of smoke, 
uh, that they are going to be able to maintain and use that machine and keeping it open and simple and robust uh, really helps with that. So uh, also we believe in upgrades, all right? So we sell uh, an upgrade at fair cost to people rather than doing what Apple do and make them buy a whole new thing. All right, so we have the anti-Apple policy. Um, consequently, uh, I spend a lot of time in the workshop um, working on adaptations, improvements, and, and so forth. So um, that's, that's what I do a lot. <laughs> and uh, I, I just pretend it's one of our awkward customers. Uh, and this is, is, is what my mum thinks I do. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, this is what my wife <laughs> thinks I do. Uh, and this is what the press <laughs> think I do. <laughs> All right, uh, 3D printing guns. Yeah, okay. Boring, yep. Um, not so boring for uh, this poor chap. Uh, Yoshitomo Imura uh, sent down for two years for making guns with a 3D printer. They're not even very good guns. I mean, for crying out loud, if you're going to do something that's going to get you put in the clink for two years, you know, do it properly. <laughs> right? So, uh, that's, um, oh, what was it, Thunder? Uh, that's a, the, the Thunder Gun from Destiny or something? Has anybody heard of Destiny? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so <laughs> one, one, of the, uh, one of the nice things about 3D printed guns, uh, as it were, is that people have woken up and paid attention to all the media crap and they have discovered 3D printing because of some idiots making 3D printed guns. All right. Uh, by the way, please, you sell, if you want to make a gun, use a lathe. They're cheaper than 3D printers and they don't blow up in your face. All right. So it, here's an example of a, a, a chap who has discovered 3D printing. Uh, this one. Now, uh, he's, he's pleased as punch with his new hand um, because kids grow out of prosthetics really fast. And uh, so the, it's, it's very hard to invest a lot of money in new limbs for a child all the time. So uh, being able to print a custom limb that is, really, uh, that is relatively inexpensive and works just as well uh, as the more expensive versions um, it is really important uh, for, for kids. Um, and no, he didn't blow his hand off with a 3D printed gun. Um, so they've just discovered 3D printing. Um, th th they have a company called Andy Ammo and um, they, they print uh, orthopedic back, back braces for children. Um, and, and that's one of them. And um, she's just discovered that 3D printing is very handy. Uh, she has a, a selection of different colored limbs to match the outfit, which of course you can do with a 3D printer. And he's just discovered 3D printing. Uh, no, wait. Where are I? Yes, he's just discovered 3D printing. This is uh, Maurice Williamson, one of our New, Ze New Zealand MPs who thinks guns print gold, uh, 3D printers print gold and things. Uh, they do when you put in gold. Right? When you put in gold, yeah, they, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and yes, he's our minister for silly ideas. So, um, but you can actually print metal, more or less, even with a really cheap 3D printer. All right, you just have to adapt some old technology. Um, that was printed on, more or less, one of our standard printers. Um, all you do is you make, you make use of the fact that uh, the PLA filament, the pure PLA filament, uh, vanishes to nothing when you heat it up. It, it just bugs off to infinity at 300 Celsius. All right? So uh, you, you print your object that you want in metal in PLA plastic. Um, and then you, you have a lot of fun with um, plaster. Plaster of Paris is, is, is fine. Dunk the thing in water to get rid of air bubbles first, otherwise they come out as little metal blisters. Uh, put plaster all over it, 
Uh, if there's anything that looks like it's uh, going to need reinforcement, we have this stuff called pink bats. Do you have pink bats here? Yeah, um, you, you make that all squishy with plaster and pack it in there and it, it's, it, it sort of doesn't fall off in the middle uh, if you've got some fine detail. Um, and I put, ice, I put ice cubes in the water because it slows the plaster setting down. Otherwise you end up trying to stick clods of plaster onto things, which isn't very nice. Um, and then when you've got plaster all around it, you, you add a container and some I.O. Um, the container is basically if your mould cracks, so you don't end up with a workbench full of hot metal. Um, and, the I, and the I.O. port in the top there is uh, a, a beeswax candle. All right. And that will form a channel into which you will be pouring the metal. And there's, uh, you usually add uh, another little channel, can't see it in this photo, uh, and that's to let the air out when you pour the metal in, otherwise it goes bleep, and when molten metal does that, it's not fun. Um, so, you, I put a thermocouple in there as well, so I know what temperature is inside there, and so I can then bake it for six hours at 300 degrees Celsius, or until golden brown and delicious. Um, at that point, there is nothing inside that mould. Uh, we can fix that. Um, I then get a little crucible, um, and that is containing uh, Britannia pewter, which is lead and cadmium free, and suitable for making food wherewith. Uh, melts at about 290, you actually want to pour it at about 350. Uh, so it's still nice and uh, liquid inside the mould. So you give the mould a tap after you've poured it, get the air bubbles out, it's quite dense so the bubbles pop out really easily. Um, and then you uh, wait for it to cool and destroy the mould by any means necessary. And once you've uh, fished it out, ta -da! you have a metal object. All right, that's one way of making metal objects um, on a budget. There's um, there's another way of making metal objects with 3D printers, which works really, really well. Um, though perhaps it's not a technique you'd use in the living room. Um, you take a MIG welder and you use that as your print head. <laughs> right. hmm, works. Support material's a bit dicey, but uh, for, for, for bonus points, you build V2 the other way round so that the sparks don't fall into your electronics. Um, and, and then some clever bugger in the engineering department next door just sort of gets a robot arm, sticks a MIG welder on the end of it and makes a really big one. So, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so there's a robot arm. Uh, sort of MIG welder wasn't really appropriate for the exhibition hall, so that one's just squirting foam. Uh, obviously, you can apply a whole load of manufacturing techniques to it that way. And um, obviously, um, the bigger the arm, the bigger your potential build volume. Yeah? Um, so you sort of start wondering, okay, how big can we get this thing? Mm, well, um, that is not a small building. Um, that is what, what we jokingly refer to as uh, well, uh, the FGFDM, the Very Large Fusion Deposition Model. Uh, that is a, a Voxel Jet VX4000. And um, it's actually, it actually is a, a, a plastic printer. It's not printing with foam or, or concrete or anything like that. It actually does melt plastic, build things up, you can print cars and stuff on it. Um, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's not the biggest, okay? Now the Chinese are really big into 3D printing. Uh, when I say big, I mean really big. Also, that's not plastic, that's laser sintered titanium. As you can see, they have a nice big environmentally controlled chamber uh, in which they can print absolutely colossal titanium objects. And um, I can't think why the Chinese would be wanting to make really large things out of titanium. I have absolutely no idea at all why they would be wanting to print very large things out of titanium. Mm. Um, what temperature is that? 
uh, that's, that, that's laser sintered somewhere between two and three thousand Celsius. It's uh, yeah, and they've uh, and they're printing the whole. Uh, they're three D printing the whole um, airframe in sections of titanium down the plane, and the two, you can see there's the two holes there for the air intake. And uh, as as the sections progress down the fuselage, they get more and more circular to accommodate for the shape of the jet engine. Uh, so, yeah, amazing piece of technology. Um, but uh, yeah, that's not their biggest three D printer. Okay, here we have 120 tons of Chinese pride. Um, this is a 12 by 12 by 12 meter build volume. Uh, it prints with graphene glass fiber reinforced plastic. And um, it's, it's part of an, a, an expo. And uh, the printer is going to be at the expo for some time, uh, printing a seven meter tall middle, uh, uh, model of uh, the Temple of, Heb of Heaven, which is China's largest sacrificial temple. Um, I like the twin head design. If you look at that, they've got one head on each side of the, uh, of the rail in the middle, so that while one head is printing, the other head is not, uh, can be moved over to the side for reloading, maintenance, or by, just so it doesn't dribble crap all over everything that the other one's printing. Um, I think I'm going to swipe that for my next printer design. That's, that's good. Uh, all right, so we've done big. All right, should you have a crack at small? All right, okay. Um, that's the, uh, the iBox Nano. Prints a colossal 40 by 20 by 90 millimeter objects. Um, the layers can be 0.39 microns thin, but unfortunately the blobs it prints are about 0.3 millimeters across. And the utility of having a vertical resolution 1% of your horizontal resolution, resolution is kind of dubious. Um, but it's cute, it's cheap, it's small, and it uh, uses photo setting resin. So, um, with photo setting resin, uh, the finer you can focus your laser down, the smaller the object you can build. That one uses LEDs, so hence lousy resolution. Uh, but uh, this little mech is one millimeter tall. Uh, it's printed by a device called the NanoScribe, which can get down to 30 nanometer layers. Um, and obviously much higher resolution than the, the, the tiny little box. Um, now, you start to run out of poke with lasers after a while. Uh, you can't focus them down to a dot, so you have to, to use a clever trick um, called two-photon uh, photolithography. And um, that's, that's uh, the, the scale bars 10 microns down the bottom. Um, so we're now starting to get de uh, features that you're, you're measuring in nanometers. All right. And as we start to make things smaller and smaller, um, we start to get to the point where we're manipulating large molecules. And eventually, you start to realize that large molecules can be machines in their own right. So we can't build that. We can design it. We can work out all the parameters and everything. Can't build it yet. As soon as we can build it, then we've got the designs ready to roll. But, um, you know, Mother Nature beat us to it. That is the, uh, the ATP synthase rotary engine that is the power plant for all the cells in your body. Um, it, it generates the, uh, the, the, the chemical that your body uses to run for power. Um, and so we have machines that are in nature and um, we're now starting to be able to print bits of nature itself, or us. We can print uh, scaffolds, we can print blood vessels, we're starting to print body parts. And we're not just printing passive um, replacements for our, our body parts, we're actually starting to integrate uh, sensors and actuators and things with our body. This is a cardiac sleeve, it's used for monitoring um, cardiac conditions and uh, obviously could be used to stimulate as well. And so what with um, 3D printing interfacing directly to our body and our body being a little power plant for machines, you have to wonder 
at some point where that leaves us exactly. Mm. And that's me. Thank you.